Welcome to the movie trap. Uh, we are back on our regular bullshit after last week. Um, this is a podcast in which we choose a theme, uh, a movie theme, I should say. Each of us picks a movie in that theme, and at the end of each of our choices, we vote on which was the best, and then and the winner chooses the subsequent theme. Uh, last week, we did not do that. Uh, we had we had an episode where Chris won a Halloween mini contest and gave us border. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So so take the concept you just heard, throw it in the trash. We're doing mm -hmm. a separate thing, but we've finished that separate thing. We're back in the main thing now. Exactly. Welcome to the show. Right. Here we go. This is the I also I also feel like I need to do corrections department right up front <laughs> <laughs> because. We thought the Wicker Man episode would come out on the 30th or the 31st of October. That was incorrect. <laughs> uh, we said acted this, that much. But, yeah. but in, in true governmental fashion, mistakes were made. Uh, multiple parties were guilty of this That's since right. all three of us saw not just a paper, but a calendar. I That's should have realized right. it. And we, uh, it's okay. We, we did a thorough committee hearing and a thorough investigation. And uh, this is not a this is not a press conference, so there'll be no questions. But it's, this is yes. just an announcement. Time zones and like figuring out shits on calendars are the two weaknesses of my entire like life blood. Like I cannot do it for for the for for the life of me. Well, I mean, before you take too much credit for this personally, I have it on strong authority that the calendar mistake was the act of a single rogue actor. <laughs> that's mm. right. That's, that's what right. I heard. Okay. That's that's uh -huh. what they told me on the news. That's right. So stay tuned while we track down <laughs> whoever. <laughs> the movie trap has its own adversary now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's time. <laughs> Wait, it's what would be the opposite of a, the movie freedom? I guess I don't know what would be. I don't know. Yeah, the the emancipator. It. Yeah, the movie emancipator. Oh, that's funny. But the opposite would just really be money. Just give me money. Yes. That would be the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> like it's you know we're, we're putting out the quality we're giving up the time someone that's hand us right. the money this is the that's third right. part of the triangle right. there is a <laughs> slight upside uh last time i said you guys uh, I, I told the audience that they knew the results of the presidential election of 2020 that was not mm -hmm. true uh, at it, the time that episode was released, but it is now. Yeah, now it's true. <laughs> now it's true, which is uh, it's great that we're doing um, this particular theme for it, too, because and this particular movie. Um, yeah, it's, so, it's strong for the SEO right now. Very strong for the SEO. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, um, so the theme this week was chosen by Chris Poroff because he won the category way back when we did the shitty cops category and he won mm -hmm. the Stanford prison experiment his theme that he chose for us his co-host which I guess I didn't even say my name my name is Russell Carlson by the way um and uh this is uh, Chris let's let's do that this is crazy okay. my name's Chris Boroff who are you guys why well, I'm Russell Carlson I'm Zach Powers. I was supposed to do all this shit, but it's the first week. It's the first week we were like changing the role, the the roles that everyone's supposed to do. Right. And I, I'm not quite comfortable yet. So 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 give us one week leeway. That's right. It's a right. And so your your rookie bye week. Um. So anyway, the the theme this week was political thrillers. This is round one, round mm -hmm. one of the theme for political thrillers, which Borif won. And his choice was 1979's The Parallax View. Uh, yeah. 74. I, 1974. Yeah. Oh, 74. I, Oops. I picked it at random because it was suggested by a former guest we had. This is actually a suggestion of Tim Talbot that I had seen on the list for a long time. It was also suggested by another lady named Amber, Amber Alexander, who's a writer I follow. So when you get two suggestions from fairly smart people, I try to listen to them. Um, but, uh, also in the sense of having smart people that we want to listen to, we're actually going to have Zach, uh, do the <laughs> entire synopsis for this and try it. We're going to try it, uh, this way going forward. Obviously, if you guys have short, not extremely long tangents about the plot or something <laughs> that I forgot, feel free to jump in while I get yeah. a, 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 uh, a rough idea of what the parallax view is about and as mentioned the parallax view is a 1974 film starring uh warren Beatty, uh, a person i've seen in 
honestly, very few movies. Uh, I think the only other starring role I've seen him in is Bullworth. Um, yeah, that's true for me, too. Bullworth and Dick Tracy. Those are the only two I know him from. Well, I haven't seen Dick Tracy, so I'm one behind you. You guys never seen Bonnie and Clyde? Oh, we actually, have- you know what? I saw Bonnie and Clyde when I was very young. Okay. I- yeah. I've seen clips. I've never actually watched it. Okay. Uh, regardless, the film is directed by Alan uh, Pakula, who uh, did a number of, of, of well-known movies. Uh, Sophie's Choice is one of them. This is the second in his Paranoia uh, trilogy, which includes Clute, which I've never seen, and All the President's Men, possibly the most famous political thriller of all time. Um, but I this believe is the so, yeah. Child. Arguments could be made. Yeah, yeah, well, people still talk about that movie, which is the interesting part, because most yeah. most films from that era sort of fade. Like, we don't really hear about Clute that much. I know that no. it's a good movie, that it was high, highly nor, acclaimed. Nor this, which yeah. uh, was only two years prior to All the President's Men. Yeah. Right. Um, regardless, this is a film about Joe Frady, who is a journalist, a very, like, sort of... Um, Riggs from Lethal Weapon style journalist who's like got that mullet look and doesn't play by the rule book that his editor editor puts down for him. Yeah, he feels vaguely like Jimmy Stewart if he ever got out of the chair in rear window and went and did his job. <laughs> like that's who they set him up to be, but we just see him stuck in one room for the whole movie. So yeah, it's that character off doing his thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning of the film, he is at the Seattle Space Needle for a uh, political rally for a presidential nominee. This nominee is assassinated in a scene that I think is almost certainly inspired by the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Um, One person is very clearly shown to be like the public face of the killer, while a second in the shadows member of the wait staff was the one who did the actual shooting. Uh, that person who everybody sees with a gun ultimately falls off the Seattle Space Needle while while police attempt to apprehend him. Uh, cut to several years later. Uh, Joe meets up with his friend who was also there on the night of the assassination. And she says she is concerned because a number of witnesses to that assassination have ended up dead themselves. Yeah, she's Joe, also set up briefly as the only romantic interest he has in the film because they I have would a, say they extremely have a briefly. History. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there's and a very brief that, backstory that they woman, dated. Even that he's got another woman in the room, so like it's not really all that romantic. Yeah. Um, but, so uh, Joe initially is a little incredulous of this idea that there's some kind of grand conspiracy. But only a few days later, this woman winds up dead in the morgue with enough barbiturates and alcohol to kill a horse. Uh, Nominally, it was a car accident, but theoretically she was drunk. A really wonderful edit, too, like because they go from her talking and him and him consoling her to an immediate cut to her as a dead body in a morgue. Loved it. Which plays that ominous music. Yeah. Yeah. Some films, they try that and they just screw it up. Like, I think uh, Hostel tried that with one of their characters where they go from being a character to being bits and pieces of a body, which was very alienating. In this part, it was great. It really gave an uncomfortable, sort of uncanny feeling to the whole sequence. Right. Yeah. Uh, So Joe begins his deep plunge into the conspiracy theory behind this political assassination. And uh, he follows up on one of the leads that uh, his uh, recently deceased friends gave him. Somebody drown in a nearby town. He goes to that town. He fights Salmon Tail. Tail, Correct. He fights a big deputy played by Wilson from Home Improvement. Um, (laughs) That's 100 percent true. He meets up with the sheriff of that town who turns out to be in on the conspiracy, attempts to murder him, and the sheriff ends up drowned himself. Uh, So he finds in the sheriff's home a psychopath test from the Parallax Corporation. Uh, He brings it to a psychologist who says these people are clearly testing for sociopathy, psychopathy, stuff uh, we call like an antipersonal or an anti, uh, an antipersonal 
what is it? An antisocial antisocial personality, personality disorder. That's it. Yeah. It's, uh, to varying degrees, people who are more than willing to commit acts of extreme violence without guilt. So, uh, Joe uh, sends in one of these tests under an assumed name to the Parallax Corporation uh, and is uh, visited, all the while being uh, harangued by his boss, who thinks this is a non story. But he is eventually visited by a representative of the Parallax Corporation who says, you are exactly the kind of person we want for our special program. I feel like we skipped over a a pretty big scene is that he meets the uh, the chief of staff of the first senator who was killed of that time ago on a boat. Oh, correct. You're right. right. Uh, You're right. You're right. We did skip over that. Yeah. So and that's yeah. It, well, it's funny because it actually brings up a thing. Like, I think last week you mentioned uh, we we determined after the fact that um, uh, this film was not the favorite film of um, what is Sid his Field. name? Sid, Sid, Sid Field. Uh, but while I was watching it, I did happen to write down things thinking it was a Sid Field thing. And the dam scene would be the first pinch, I believe. And I believe this would be the mid act like this might be another pinch it's strange because it has like two pinches because there's it's interesting him yeah, almost I, getting killed and then it's him almost getting killed on the boat right so it was really kind of like oh this doesn't have just two right, pinches this has like there's a, a second more action in this yeah. movie than i anticipated to right the, yeah. the 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 because the the editor tries to shrug off the sheriff killings the sheriff trying to drown him as well these are just corrupt sheriffs had nothing to do with the senator they had their own dirty laundry that they yeah. had to deal with um and then he almost gets blown up on a boat and that's when they know that it's serious. Anyway, Zach, I digress. Russell, you're correct. I I, I skipped over the fact that he meets with the aide to the senator who was killed in the opening scene, the presidential candidate, who again, yeah, is played by Mr. Feeney from Boy Meets World. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mr. Feeney gives him uh, an image that identifies the possible assassination of the original presidential candidate. He goes on to meet up with a member of the Parallax Corporation as a possible recruit for this assassination program, which I think it's fairly obvious what they're recruiting for at this point. Uh, Shortly thereafter, uh, following this recruiter, he finds that he sees uh, the assassin that he got a picture of heading towards an airport. He follows him, boards the plane, pays for his ticket while he's on board the plane, which is, is that a thing that used to happen? And it was only like 50 bucks, too. It was uh, 68 something. Well, the the idea that someone's like suitcase could end up on the plane without them is part of the process that would not happen now. Like a lot of this, I'm looking at it, I'm like, no, no, man, none of that would work in 9-11. No, no. Everything happening in the sequence could be solved with the text. None of this would happen. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, there's a there's a sequence where he knows there's a bomb on the plane and he plays it. I would say too cool. <laughs> uh, I would be yeah. freaking out a little more. Uh, yeah, I would be like, was, yeah. my cover, my cover is secondary. We can get into that a little later. But I, w- I wonder if there's like a contractual thing where it's like, yeah, I can't look scared. I'm the leading man. You can't make me look scared in the movie. Well, but uh, I, yeah. just, he, he tries several ways to inform the staff without incriminating himself that he knows there's a bomb on the plane. It, theoretically, in order to pursue this story. But also, if you're dead because a bomb blew up on a plane... You're not going to be able to pursue the fucking anyway. story. Mm-hmm. It should also be said that there is a prominent senator on board this play who Correct. is in yes. a election fight with a George Hammond. Yes, there's there's yeah. two yeah. the you know, the reasons and the the causality between what the main character is doing and where he ends up gets very confusing at a couple points. This is one of them because I don't know why he's the on the plane. The external politics of what's going on in the world are yeah. unclear. Very murky. There is yeah. there is a group that wants to assassinate prominent political figures what those political figures stand for unclear yeah yeah 
and which yeah. side of which political anyway it doesn't matter but i mean in this um, case it's even like a question of like why he ended up on the plane because i think when sure. i when i read the synopsis afterwards i was like oh okay so he the explanation was he'd followed the mysterious man to the plane and saw him he get did. on the plane yes. and all that so it led him to do that but it, yeah. it means that he would have had to have had some moment in there where he decided to get on a plane knowing there was a bomb on board, knowing he was going to do everything else. It's a I, little ballsy, but it seems like there was never a moment of him making that decision. It's, it's also a, very, a little unclear because uh, at the end of the movie, he goes to a political rally for this guy is, as far as I can tell, his rival for the presidential camp, like uh, his presidential rival in the election. And that guy ends up getting killed by the Parallax Corporation. So I don't know if this was a fake attempt or if they were trying to kill both of them. That is unclear to me. I, I yeah. have a theory about that. Yeah. Um, I, I've got a theory about that. But basically, yeah, they, they end up framing the Parallax Corporation frames Frady uh, right. for the murdering this, of that. So, yeah. Yeah, going forward, couple, yeah. he is uh, his editor is killed, um, and he is found out to be having uh, he he is discovered to be having a fake identity by the Parallax Corporation by his quote unquote handler there, uh, and he follows him. He spots him at the Parallax Corporation and follows him to a an event for Senator Hammond, and he sneaks up into the catwalk. Because at this point, he suspects this is basically a professional assassination organization. And Hammond is shot dead from somewhere off screen. And he realizes all too late, he is the scapegoat. He is the one they're going to pin this assassination on. And as he's trying to escape, Freddy is shot to death by someone with a shotgun. And the concluding scene of the film is uh, a Senate uh, investigatory committee deciding that this was a single man. There were no, there was no conspiracy in the assassination of Senator Hammond. It was just Joe Frady who had succumbed to paranoid delusions. Yeah, it's it's nice because it works as a bookend because it's yeah. like a coda on the film, and they have a it's a callback to the first part in the film where the first political assassination happens, and then you hear a very specious explanation that is obviously not true based off what you just saw. Yeah, down and to then the parade. they do that again for the end. Yeah, yeah, down to the parade even. You know, oh. and I thought the the yeah. last scene was very apparently the idea was to have that banquet like full of people and it was like a last minute decision to change that i thought brilliant decision to keep it empty because that kept yeah. that whole because the whole movie's very eerie right like mm. I, I i find that you know like the plot sort of shatters and then kaleidoscopes into this sort of not really a coherent narrative but more like paranoid bits of what's happening because you don't really get what's going on you're like one of the best moments of the movie board you brought up earlier when he that cut is because yeah, that's when I got the sense that, okay, I am going to learn information at the same speed as Freddy. Like, it's going to come at me. I am, he is my vessel to discovering mm -hmm. this world. And it does a good job of keeping to that throughout the movie because he has no idea. I mean, he has no fucking clue. He's just trying to follow any lead, basically. I mean, I'll grant you without much forethought because he's just sort of like barreling into it. Well, it's funny you say that because it's like one of the co-writers on this was Robert Town. Um, he was an uncredited writer. He did um, Chinatown. And I think he was one of the guys that um, had the rule, or at least the opinion later, that the protagonist should show up in every single scene. So there's a lot of scenes in Chinatown mm -hmm. where they go out of their way to have Nicholas or Nicholson show up. I'll be honest, that sounds like a shitty rule, but it, okay. <laughs> it, I mean, this is like 70s. This wasn't my rule. This was what he suggested. Um but I do notice this one does have one specific moment where they don't have the protagonist present when something occurs, and that's when his uh, hand or when his uh, handler at the newspaper, his newspaper editor boss, is murdered. That's the one that's scene true. where he's not yeah. present for the whole time, and I don't that's know if true. he even is they aware of the, the murder later. Yeah, that's true. I don't. I think can't so remember. It seems to have been concurrently with the second yeah, rally because it almost feels like he thought he was going in like safe and didn't know he was in danger, but we do. But the ending of this, like most of the stuff I pull from it is like from other people's interpretations. Because when I first watched it, so, mo so much of it is underplayed that it's not clear and easy uh -oh. to answer in like modern 
film terms. Like if yeah. we were watching this now, you'd be like, oh, there's your plot point. There's that. But in this one, they had whole sequences where you're left wondering, like there's a, a sequence in which he's tested um, for his psychological profile. Yeah, and sure. it's, it's a really fascinating sort of montage thing. It's very 60s, 70s. Yeah, the um, clockwork orange. That, yeah, that is no. extremely. Yeah, there's there's a couple. So there's there's two build ups to this. First, I guess the Parallax Corporation sends out these tests that are clearly psychopath tests. At one point, Freddy has a known psychopath take the test as cover for himself, I guess. Uh, he uses those results. But then he goes to the Parallax Corporation and they have this, perhaps the most striking moment in the entire movie for me, this montage of images over different words and ideals. So it's like me, mother, father, home, family, happiness. enemy, country, country, happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, they and, have, the, and the and the images go from being you know very uh, happy and pleasant to being more of how you'd probably assume like you know uh, a lone gunman would probably see himself right. in the world as the beat down individual and, and they, they even also, like show Thor a lot. They, yeah. throw, they show throw Thor a great deal, which is actually in terms of like alt right people nowadays very accurate, like yeah, Viking yeah. and Norse. Yeah, that's mythology. That's been, that's, that's been idolization to, is, is extremely that's common. been linked to German for uh, it's been linked to the Nazi party ever since yep. Hitler was so obsessed, obsessed with their Nibeling, like the ring cycle and just locked but, all the like Viking stuff into that. Yeah, specifically, it's like Jack Kirby's drawing of Thor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not like it's not like something. an ancient. It's not like an old Thor. It's like yeah, comic yeah. book nineteen sixties. Yeah, Thor. right. Before yeah. before they had to pay Disney for that image. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. So like, but yeah, but ultimately true. the the symbols become more mixed, right? So which really mother is a very caring figure, and then there's another montage of mother where she's worrying and destitute and scared. The same thing happens with home and father, and eventually Country. the the images that showed up in enemy, which were originally like Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany and Mao Zedong, those start showing up in country or in me. And so the sense of what is what becomes more garbled as the montage goes on. I thought it was one of the most interesting parts of the entire film. For yeah, sure, it, because it does what the plot does. You know, it sends your brain through like a blender almost, you know, and you're sort of left to try to figure out this spider web of whatever the fuck is going on with Warren Beatty. Um, while all this shit's going down, you know, and it's, that's, I, 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 and they shoot it like that too, because they're very long lenses, you know, so like, it's particularly in the last scene where he's in the catwalk, you know, following the guy, you know, you can tell they're using a really long lens because the guy is just taking forever to get down that corridor, you know, and I know that that's how it's, it's building this, this, this tension and this paranoia where you're not really a hundred percent sure What's I yeah. mean, the movie really plays it out. This fucking senator is going to get shot. It, it by the time it happens, you're like, well, I should have saw it coming because God, there's a parade. Everybody's practicing for it. They have a nice interview. Everything looks rosy. And typically when that happens in this movie, somebody gets killed. Um, yeah. The cinematographer on this is Gordon Willis. The great Gordon Willis. Yeah. He's yep. done tons of stuff like all yep. of, did all six of uh, he did six of Alan J. Pakula's films. Yep. Uh, all the Godfathers. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep, legend in that era of the 70s, too. Um, yeah. I'll, 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 as far well, as low it works really well with that door trick because they do that years later in um, the movie with uh, Marathon Man. Well, Marathon yeah. Man, yeah, but they do yeah. that trick a lot with like the door seems to be getting further away as it's as you're running towards it. Um, they also did that in Contact, uh, yeah, which okay. is running to the doorway and stuff like that. But yeah, um, a lot of the stuff in this was interesting. The music, I really like the music because it like makes you uncomfortable all the time did did you like how it basically is the same soundtrack from all the president's men i mean it's it's almost verbatim i haven't seen all the presidents okay men. well give that movie a watch oh. and you tell me what's the difference between it um but it, it would I'll, I'll get it all the president's men because it's this is it, considering the pacula trilogy of political paranoia i too have not seen clued i, 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 haven't, seen I haven't seen clued either i i did a um, like i did a very brief glimpse of the wikipedia page without spoiling myself too much i don't know how much it's political uh i got the vibe that it was just like kind of uh I don't know, almost a noir uh, that has well, very little and, to do with 
Like it has something to do with a top CEO of an oil well, company, I but it doesn't it, have it much to do with specifically paranoia. Because that one, yeah. if I remember correctly, I haven't seen it either. But my mom compared it when we were watching the movie Hardware way back in like '93 so, to the movie Clute. Because I guess there's a whole sequence in there in which someone's watching the woman involved through a lens from across the way, and it gets very, very yeah. um, voyeuristic. And right. I saw, I saw it originally called the Political Paranoia Trilogy and then later referred to as the Paranoia Trilogy. And yeah. the latter seems more accurate. Well, yeah. I, I, I think political thriller, you, you mentioned it's more noir-like. To me, they're almost interchangeable uh, because a lot of the films of the 40s and 50s had some sort of political bent. I mean, I would argue even if it is a CEO businessman, that is in some way political because you could say like the, the conversation has a lot of sort of political thriller like things even though it doesn't really have anything to do with politics it has to do with like this rich old guy you know and his cheating wife or whatever um so well i mean okay i mean to be fair like i'm going to make a a grand statement that you guys may not agree with but i think you probably will because you're not children (laughs) <laughs> all art is political like art okay, is well, political yeah, okay yeah that is like, fair that is fair there's yes, very I mean, little art that does not have a political state trolls yeah. world tour i'm sure yeah, has a no. political thing to say about the state of the world today uh, yes our art in the age of mechanical reproduction has said a lot about the nature of art as its service <laughs> is to the political parties i agree all <laughs> art is at its core political i understand um, um yeah no and that's but like the <laughs> I wouldn't just uh, it, the the paranoia aspect of parallax view, I think, is what makes it more, more political. Well, in political assassinations that automatically yeah. you're in the, the category of political thrillers. But I, I was watching it when I was thinking it because I thought of like the old like night in the city movies back back in the early 50s or whatever these noir films that were coming out. Um, and they're also very like anxiety driven and sort of paranoia and how they are kind of political thrillers of the 70s i mean that's where we really get the era because i think part of the power of the parallax view is it's such of its time and not just of the time it existed in, but the time it had currently existed in previously because this is a more or less a therapy piece to deal with robert kennedy martin luther king yeah. all these political that first game, scene you know. was so explicitly uh inspired by robert kennedy yeah. and i think even in some ways the golf cart feels like a weird yeah. pantomime yeah. of the jfk assassination yeah. I didn't, uh, I the the, the so political true. figure at the end is shot while he's driving a golf cart uh, across an empty auditorium yeah. and then just rams into a bunch of tables yeah. at, well it's, it's it's which it's i love that shot i did too it was great well that's one of the things about this one that i really liked um it's a very reserved film with how they shoot it like they let the camera sit. It doesn't immediately cut to close ups a lot of the times. And a lot of the stuff that would happen later, like the over explaining of stuff that is so common later, isn't something that happens here. And it plays out so much better because it's like it, it, it plays out in the same way as the opening sequence of uh, Children of Men. Mm-hmm. Where if you guys remember the explosion scene at the beginning of that, mm-hmm. it's so underplayed and you're so unaware it's going to happen because it's a long take. So mm-hmm. it works similar to the long take, except rather than following a character around, you're just very sort of objectively showing the scene and you never, you never know when something's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So they'll show you a wide shot and you're just like, oh, okay, it's a wide shot. They've shown me a bunch. But then suddenly in one wide shot, a boat explodes. Right. Or something else happens and it's right. suddenly a huge shock. You're like, oh, I didn't know that was going to occur. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. why I, I was reading old reviews on this in the Wikipedia page and they were trying, like one of the knocks on the parallax view was that, you know, well, if Hitchcock could do it, blah, blah, blah. If Hitchcock was doing it. And I was thinking, well, they weren't trying to do a Hitchcock movie. They're, yeah. they, this is more like Stanley Kubrick than it is yeah. Hitchcock. I just, um, you know, no, I mean, like, would you elements of even uh I, the, the degree of action is is interesting like there was a lot more action in this movie than i thought there were car chases there were fights to the death on different Boring rivers that yeah you know, bar yeah. fights Before that CGI. last five minutes yeah <laughs> you know? oh yeah that was, that was fun to actually see them go places to shoot things uh yeah, where right. it wasn't just a green screen behind everybody all the time yeah and that was that an was... actual dam unloading its water there yeah. with the actual horns and stuff you know like uh, amazing they you could tell they strongly because they did not actually blow up a plane the camera very conspicuously goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could see you could, yeah. you could see the plane flew off into the savings of their budget. Um, 
Yeah. They the, blew up uh, a boat. They blew up yeah, that that's boat. That's true. That's true. They did blow up that boat. That that was where that was the hard well, line. And Roger, there was somebody on that boat jumping off the deck. Yep. Good yeah. set work. Well, Roger yeah. Ebert um, had comments on this one. I actually went back and reread it because I was just curious to see what he would think. And he said that it seemed like the plot was more important than characters. And he thought that uh, Warren Beatty was sort of wasted in this film because the character is so one dimensional. They could have had someone who was less of a uh, 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 a draw and less of a stalwart actor in that okay, part. Does he and know it how fun. the movie business works? They only show up because Warren Beatty. If it was just some uh, random asshole, they're probably here's not the gonna thing. Well, this is Ro- also the 1970s, so it's yeah. probably different. Yeah, yeah. It's also this is also Roger Ebert. I don't know if he really ever knew how the industry worked i think he always had opinions i think that was how that worked Um, i I can relate Um, (laughs) but um, that was one of those things like what do you guys think do you think it was a one-dimensional character like how would this guy stack up against uh some of the man on the run stuff you said you didn't think it was uh like uh hitchcock so like hitchcock's movies tended to be man on the run this one feels man on the run so where would it fall for you i you know i guess it's it's not i i guess i wouldn't call him one dimensional's kind of you don't do a lot of character digging into Warren Beatty and who he is. And when you do, it's very briefly and very tight. Um, you know, you knew he had a drinking problem, um, you know, and without really going into it and having this moment where he's, you know, being chased by the Parallax Corporation, look at a bottle of Jim Beam, being like, oh, there you are, sweet thing. I can do it right now. You know, they didn't they didn't lean into that. And I almost sort of like that better. Um, but what I mean about it, it, what the Hitchcock was like, how Hitchcock reveals information to the audience. This movie does not hold you by the hand. You mean um, the graphical language she uses? Yeah, okay. yeah, that's what I was talking about. Not so much like because from from that perspective, from the man on the run perspective, I could see that you know that where you are kind of similar to Hitchcock. There isn't a lot of what the character inner desires don't really come into play other than he just wants to get the story and maybe that is what gets him into it his desire to just break the story come hell or high water is kind of what does him in um so i, yeah. I guess in that respect maybe i contradict myself but um, I don't know. What, do you, what do you think zach how, do, how does the character play out for you uh i i gotta say like ultimately i described him when i first started watching the movie and at the beginning of this podcast as a sort of rogue actor 80s cop and I, he always a little felt like that to me yeah i don't know like he was smart but never like especially it's- individual among film characters um his 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 identity he was, he was okay like I, I i don't have strong complaints against him but i also don't think i'm going to say joe frady he's a He's a paragon of like character <laughs> development. Right. <laughs> well, it's, like, just kind um, of, it's just kind of funny in this case because it's um, like with this particular guy and how he was introduced, like um, I really, really enjoyed how economical they were with screen time and setting up people who were about to be victims because you got to know them on a level that was just enough. It wasn't like a whole. You know, it wasn't walking by an apple orchard, having a heart to heart. It was just, you know, you got enough of a sprinkling of this is what the personality is. Even the guy who gets shot at the end, like he's 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 listening to his own speech and playback and talking about golf. And you get a sense of the guy immediately. <laughs> you do. He's I like, actually really yeah. that was that was maybe my favorite bit of characterization in the movie is that politician at the end who, uh, you know, he wasn't like caricaturishly bad or good. Like he met with these young kids who came out to play his rally. It was like, mm-hmm. "What's up, kids?" Yeah, I, I'm not going to lie. Speech. I, yeah. I was going to, and he uh, smoked a cigarette while his speech played <laughs> during yeah, the dress yeah, rehearsal. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> I kind of <laughs> love that character. Yeah, and yeah. He just just drives around all the time in a golf cart. Um, that well, it's funny that you should mention that, Zach, because I was going to um, award a bonus point for the first person who brought this fact up. But nobody did, so I will. Um, uh, that, that actor's name is Jim Davis. Um, I have seen him before in Mystery Science Theater 3000 episode. The day the time ended. Is he the? I, I looked up some of these actors. Is he the one that used to be in Dallas? I believe so. That is yeah, correct. Yep. I think he was J. Are... He might have been Jr. Jr. As in who shot Jr. in 
Dallas? Uh, he was JR senior, maybe. Uh, not 100% sure because I've never seen Dallas, but I did okay. see in the day the time ended and he's very much that guy. He's basically just grilling steaks. All these weird monsters are attacking him. He's just like, oh, it must be dirt riders or some shit. You know, well, like, anyway, I mean, a lot of these dudes are like character actors that were at the end of their career being cowboys because the cowboy mm-hmm. genre had mm-hmm. essentially eroded beneath these dudes. So it's yeah. like, yeah, I can't play cookie like working on the tin can uh, making was, food for everybody anymore. It's got to be some other job now. It was either fading, uh, fading Western stars or soon to be 90s <laughs> sitcom <laughs> characters. <laughs> yeah. Because as we mentioned, Wilson from uh, Home Improvement right. and Mr. Feeney. Right. And Mr. Uh, from Who's Boy also Meets World. Elsewhere. I mean, like he's, he, yeah, he, he, he was, he's had a yeah. career before. It, it should be mentioned how handsome everybody is in this, though. Mm. Like it is. I completely it, agree. Even yeah, like Ward Beatty who's never really been my type, but I'm like, hey, yeah. he looks all right, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's like he's handsome and Mr. Feeney has like a certain like, you know, maybe English teacher hotness to him where you're like, I okay, wouldn't, okay. you know, he, I guess he might be acceptable in some weird art school. I mean, I can I understand mean, that. I, uh, you can look up some fan fiction forums. I'm sure you'll find some Mr. <laughs> Feeney. <laughs> you, you'll find some things where Mr. Feeney hooks up with. Oh, yeah. It's one of the one That'd or all crazy. of the underage uh, right. children. That, yeah. that would be or, creepy. Uh, just Mr. Feeney has a, a magical pregnancy due to Hogwarts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it exists. It's out there. Or, or he just turns into a car. <clears throat> so with this character, there's like, there's a fanfic where where Wilson from Home Improvement has like a hole in the fence and there's a whole story that arises. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, dick in the fence. Um, OK, <laughs> so I guarantee it exists. I guarantee it. <laughs> Y'all heard of Rule Thirty Four? If it's just how it is, yeah. Uh huh. Oh god! But you can only see it from you can only see the top of it though. Everything else is just hidden beneath the fence. Um. So, one question I had for you guys though is: uh, Do you think this character is kind of a doomed hero? Like it's weird. Uh, spoiler warning. I guess it's not really a spoiler warning. Who cares? This well, we're, we've already described the yeah. plot. I told you yeah. earlier. Remember the part where I said he gets shot with a shotgun? Oh yeah, that's right. right. Well, he gets shot by a shotgun. It's he is a. Uh, you know, a doomed hero. Uh, can you guys think of anything else where that's happened or something? Do you think that's why this is memorable for people that he doesn't find out who the bad guy is? It's interesting. Yeah. Well, I'd say two things. Uh, certainly, if you gave me a moment, I would, I would be able to, I'm sure, find examples of that. But, but the Parallax Corporation is weird to me in the way that, like, evil corporations from video games are weird to me. Like, so you have the umbrella corporation from like resident evil, right? Mm. And they're nominally a pharmaceutical chain, but what they mostly do (laughs) is horrible biological weapons (laughs) and parallax. As far as I know, does assassinations. What they do besides that deeply unclear, (laughs) Yeah, that, I don't that, understand why they would broadcast Department of Human Engineering. Like they would, I know, they just put that. They're on a sending these record. out to random fucking people. Right. Department of Human Engineering. Tests. What the fuck? Human Engineering. Well, there's some history to this. Uh, we're out of. We are out of context. The reason that this was in there, and the reason that they're showing it this way, is because there was a conspiracy theory at the time as to who would cause the JFK assassination. Oh, I'm surprised. Yes, the idea, <laughs> but but it was specifically, uh, this was later proven to be, uh, this. The, I mean, the whole thing is that it's a conspiracy theory. No one has found any hard evidence. At the end of the day, this was something that people Again, have argued. Again, I'm surprised. Is, well, <laughs> I know. <laughs> people have argued the conspiracy theory I'm about to say, though, has been debunked as a homophobic conspiracy theory. So I'm putting that out there before I say the rest, because it's always... Can I get hidden. any more surprised? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Permindex. Uh, Permanent Industry Exposition was a group out of Basel, Sw- Basel, Basel, Switzerland. And essentially, they argued that this was a front organization run by the CIA that paid to have... John F. Kennedy assassinated through a bunch of shell companies. And this is a common thread. People commonly say this, but most people don't understand that you wouldn't need an entire corporation to do that. It'd be very easy to have a shell company or anything smaller. This was like, I think this one was definitely during that time period where people like 
had not figured out the cognitive dissonance between having a conspiracy um, and also having okay. a completely backwards government. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead and say right now, people still definitely have not figured that out. Oh, yeah. At we're still, all. We're still yeah. chiseling away at that. But uh, if, I, 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 true. Yeah. Yeah. But Zach, go ahead. I, I know uh, beating up real, conspiracy theories is your favorite. Very <laughs> quick. Very quick. I want to say like, Conspiracy theorism is something that I really hate. <laughs> um, I think it's done a lot of damage to uh, the world in general. I think yeah. the most prescient uh, example of that right now is QAnon. Uh, but I think even like something like the JFK conspiracy theories are the ground, like the, the seedlings for that intense i don't know the, the problem with conspiracy theories is, is is eventually if you decide you believe them it's usually preying on an emotional situation and the evidence is a rash it, it doesn't matter it's right. it's 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 something you will always think happened even if you haven't yes. proven to you that it's impossible it's the same like thing it's, as like uh, uh, inoculations yeah yeah and i think it's a means of radicalizing people in many in in many situations it's um, the orwell thing. I, you uh, dislodge truth you could dislodge anything you know? i i honestly hate jfk conspiracy theories like because i think they were the like baseline for America becoming a conspiratorial country. And I think it's done a huge degree of damage. I, I think that that coupled with Watergate where there actually was a conspiracy. Oh. It's it's when, because that's what I think this movie sort of like walks that line of that. Like we've seen conspiracies come true in this decade, you know, with Watergate and, <laughs> Pro was real when everybody called the Black uh, Panthers uh, yeah. conspiracy theorists at the time sure. when it was proven exactly right. And, plus, and that, that comes, uh, when, LSD one. Right. Well, yeah. and then considering the fact that uh, the United States government has already funded a school that trains assassins. Yeah. Uh, and, and, the, and, and, the and the Contra. The focus, and the Contra thing, yeah. Yeah. The focus um, is almost always incorrect uh, among Americans. Yes. It's always like um, they killed JFK or uh, Antonin Scalia was poisoned with a pill in his meat, mm. and that shit doesn't happen. Like, obviously, if you want to talk about Guatemala, yeah, go crazy. Right. Yeah. That shit right. happens all the fucking time. Right. But Americans don't give a shit about that. No, they don't. Well, we'll see what happens in the uh, in the upcoming years. Yeah. In the upcoming years. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're bear in mind. We have to bring up again. We are still living in the blissfully ignorant times of before the 2020 election. It's not great, as you will remember it, but uh, depending on how it shakes out in the future, it could be worse. Um, no. So it, uh, and it likely will be worse anyway. But uh, that's why I, I think it's kind of fun to do the political thrillers and something like the Parallax View, which I had not seen before, and I had to watch it twice just again because it it uh, it's it, it's a movie that doesn't really hold your hand. You know, you really you're you're sort of following Joe while he's doing these kind of crazy seeming things like jumping on a plane um and then the way it unveils the danger to joe in each of those circumstances is sometimes slow but sometimes very sudden uh, you know when the sheriff immediately pulls out well i mean it's it's a slow burn and then becomes a that's a great sudden. scene yeah i think you there's know, a like, lot of great scene yeah yeah great, I, I, great like, tension building yeah. scenes in this well that yeah. one flip-flops on you too because he brings him a sandwich and you think that this guy's the guy who's actually getting along with warren Beatty. Right. Well, and I totally thought that was a poison sandwich too, because they already brought up the fact that they do poison or something. But I, I but it, it when when it starts with the the alarm sound of the the dam release, the klaxon, that yeah. very much is you're like something bad is very much going to happen. And then it does the same thing in the airplane because he's scrolling through each seat and the camera is panning back and forth, and you're looking. The airplane for is this, different for me, but okay. yeah, it, you're looking for this person, and I was even like, he's not on the fucking plane. It's a fucking bomb. Um, like yeah, to, to, uh, you know, am I misremembering or is there a shot of the person who plants the bomb watching the plane take off? Pretty yeah. much. Yeah, there's yeah. a scene of that, which I yeah. think the location they shot that might have been the uh, uh, Bob Hope Airport out here because yeah, it looks so familiar. I was yeah. like, I, I have been to that airport. To reiterate something that uh, that I said at the beginning of the podcast, 
the degree of calm with which he deals with that bomb on the plane is unrealistic to me. Like he's so concerned about not giving away his uh, like position as someone who's doing this investigation that he attempts to warn in several different ways, but it's like, Oh no, then they'll know it's me. If I were in that position, I would be like, fuck it. If this bomb goes off, I will die. And it doesn't matter. And everybody else on this plane will die too. That, that yeah. is true. I mean, even like if you it's proof, the, it's proof if you, positive. If I say there's a bomb on this plane and can prove it, guess what? Right. You just proved your fucking right. Right. But I, I you even and I agree with you, even when you couple in the calculation of the fact that if the Parallax Corporation finds out, which he thinks he's really putting one over on them, that's what I can't get over about Joe is that he really thinks he's being really clever with these people when you even know, like, they know you're fucking you know, they, they know you're not interested in being in this fucking project. Yeah. They know you're bullshit. Well, um, we see, just we, see like, we see setup for that. Like Joe makes bad decisions. Like he busts into like a, a grow house operation or something to find his parrot on the back porch and then promptly is present when the cops break into the door and like collect everyone but you kind of get the sense like this guy does not think through his actions he's very much a man of action not a thoughtful man uh so when he loses his tether to thoughtfulness with hume cronin he's just kind of out on his own and he ends badly yeah and they and they they kind of use his instinct for action against him you know that's why i think that whole bob thing was just for him i I think they just did that just for him it had nothing to do with that senator um i think they were trying to get him and they don't care um, or yeah. to just test him if they would even go through with it. They were testing his resolve or something. I don't know. Um, that's, yeah, that's well, supposedly yeah, he wasn't. I think the most to, logical. Yeah. He wasn't supposed to be there, right? Wasn't there like no. some subterfuge there? Right. Where yeah, it was he like he was supposed s- to meet up with someone, and then he contacts them and gets them to go to Maui instead. Right. I should explain that in the audience. I should explain to the audience that like part of the reason that puts him on that plane is. He, when he's on the boat with Mr. Feeney, Mr. Feeney asks him about uh, the second waiter in the first assassination in the beginning of the movie. The actual assassin. Him. Right. The character's never given a name. He's just called the Parallax Man. Um, but he's got a very distinct face. It's very brick-like. You know, it's very square-like face. Very yeah. menacing. He's he kills a number of people. Face. He kills yeah. the final senator. He kills uh, the editor of yeah. the newspaper. Cronin. Yeah. 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 So a guy the- named Bill Dennison McKinney. He is also in Deliverance. I'll be damned. And performed in seven Clint Eastwood films, as well as the outlaw Josie Wales. Oh, cool. One of the good ones. He was Captain um, Captain Terrell. There you go. Anyway, damned. keep going. Um, no, and that's why I think that I, I think that the Parallax View pretty much from the beginning knew that Brady was bullshit and was just kind of stringing him along uh, just to get to the ultimate end of He's a good foible. We'll keep him on this rat race because he's a man of action. He doesn't think through everything and we'll just keep him going because he doesn't know anything. He doesn't know anything about what's actually going on. And you and the audience don't either. You're the audience and Freddy are so linked together in this that that's what makes this movie. Not, I don't want to say uncomfortable, but it makes it kind of difficult to kind of plot it along. You know, Zach did a kind of good job of, of plotting it together because yeah. the plot it's fractures and then just kind of goes all over the place. And you're left with this sort of, paranoid mess in your brain of trying to yeah the the ultimate the ultimate true goals of the parallax corporation or whatever is deeply unclear are they for hire uncertain are they trying to progress a certain political future uncertain you don't know what these two senators or three senators they kill or attempt to kill actually believe in there's no indication yeah. of that whatsoever. Yeah, so the only the only indication you have is that it's a corporation that has somehow made its business committing murder. Yeah. And it is ever evidently somehow able to hide that. Uh, it's very strange. Um, it, it's it's weird watching I, something I, like I don't this think it's and a, comparing it to like a real world like hit squad like uh, yeah, Blackwater like or something like that. Or, yeah. yeah. I don't think uh, I don't think it's necessarily a mark against the movie that that's the case. I think it's fine. I think it works perfectly fine in the context of the film. Yeah. Uh, self-contained, you know. Yeah. And they did well, a good job mystery with the, but, with the cinematography and the locations that they picked to make Warren Beatty very small and everything. And everything's just sort of patterned in this giant, you know, array of just squares and, you know, angles and stuff. And it makes mostly it very small 
um, deeply like reflected by that those switching squares at the yeah. uh, final political rally there are mm-hmm. there are this there's this uh choir i guess you would call them of uh kids a young band. kids a marching band yeah. who have these red squares that they switch over on one side it's george washington and on another side it's thomas jefferson then another set of squares it's you know yeah. it's like it's a big uh, stadium teddy mosaic. roosevelt and yeah. then senator hammond the next mm-hmm. great president you know that kind of thing yeah, yeah big stadium big stadium mosaic uh for yeah. them to do that and, but and it, that, that's the atmosphere that it traps the main character in so you feel trapped and ominous without really knowing why so you're kind of like i said the audience is very much like Freddy. what um uh, this one was interesting with with the ending of this like how it ends did you think that um the ending was more effective or less effective because it leads you to think that there's going to be a culprit or person in charge and then you find out it's an abstract evil as opposed to an evil incarnate because you find out that it's the whole corporation and you don't have one person you can blame. So it sort of feels almost like scream to me, but I wasn't sure how you guys feel. I, I kind of feel I'm of two minds about it. It really depends on how it's done. Um, you know, I kind of when I feel like a movie is trying to just fuck with me just to put one over on me just to get a reaction then I get kind of but that's not how, how I feel how this went, especially when it bookends the title sequence at the beginning with the committee hearing at the end and both scenes are very, you know, it's almost like a stage play where it's, it's dark and it's a slow push in to this, you know, sort of like classic godlike figures of saying, well, we don't know. Ah, oh, well, on to, on we go. And then roll credits. So I sort of think that that's the way it had to end. It, it had to end with, the resolution being that there isn't going to be a resolution. So in, yeah. in, a, way, in a way, I, maybe I'm sort of, I'm, I'm sort of taking both sides of it, but in this case it worked. I thought it worked really well. I don't think yeah. you could do it any other way. I think this would be, I think this is a much more satisfying ending to this particular film about paranoia and, you know, like the 1970s were, uh, obviously there's a lot of political, uh, concern in the 2020s i would say that's a very mild way to put it i think people are terrified uh, by and large um truly on both sides of the aisle i think people are like behave uh, with or without justification they're they're perhaps more frightened than they've ever been but the age of assassination is no longer with us uh the 1970s the early 1970s after martin luther king after rfk after jfk there was a period of time where assassination was the concern of the time and yeah. i didn't live through it um but i'm sure if i did i would be i i, I never really had any deep concern that say bernie sanders would be assassinated on stage mm-hmm but at a certain time, it, it, it does seem much more. It seemed know. more common and more possible. Like this yeah. one, it's funny. One of the reasons I was asking about it is because this film reminded me a little bit with the villain uh, at the end of Broadcast News. Okay. Where I think Ned Beatty. Um, Are you thinking Ned Network? Beatty. Network, that's what I meant, okay, not Broadcast yeah. News. Yeah, Broadcast One's News Albert is Brooks. not that dark. One's a very different no, no, movie. no, no. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much for correcting that. Yeah. Um, that's one of my favorites too. Yeah, network. No, well, network because it uh, ends with like you know there is no villain. It is an abstract concept of a whole corporation exactly. that's a yeah. villain. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's a very nihilist question, and it seems very sixties to me that it is asking essentially the question, or it's saying it seems to me like the thesis or the theme of this is that buying in is selling out. So the only way to fight these people is to not engage in their business and the rest of it, but. In this film, it's like omnipresent, so there's not really a way not to play into what they do. So it's it's interesting because the film doesn't really give me a sense that it's going to get fixed uh, anytime nope. soon. So it's like nope. it's more like a horror film. Yeah, it's it's not a uh, Aaron Brockovich. You yes. don't walk out right. going, oh, it's so good that they took care of it. It's like no, this right. is going to keep happening. Right, and and I think that's uh, even because even bringing up the other of Pacula's movies that we 
that apparently all most of us have seen. Uh, all the president's men. Um, <laughs> Don't because, like me. Has, uh, have any of us seen Clute? Anybody? I have not seen Clute. Um, no, none of us. Okay. okay. But I think that uh, all the president's men doesn't, spoiler alert, Borf, but it doesn't end with, you know, Nixon going down. I mean, it, it is basically the beginning of their investigation. And then it pretty much movie ends right when they get to the second reveal that, you know, spills the whole beans or whatever. Because um, I remember Goldman talking about that when he wrote the script that, you know, because I mean, at the time of all the president's men, how many years are you removed from Watergate? Really? What, like five, mm. maybe even that, you know, like, so he was trying to find something that it was 70, 78, 72, maybe? 73 was so, when Watergate happened. And then I this think, movie came out in 74. So this right. was like all right the president's after. men, I think, was yeah. 78, 79. So um, I've never so, seen that one. Is the um, dramatic like weight of that then be that? Is that then that you know where it's going? So it's sort yeah. of it's almost like watching a yeah. prequel then? Okay. Pretty much. Yeah, that's 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 kind of yeah, how sure, it yeah. goes. So it, it ends sort of similar to the parallax view where you are you do have dissatisfied protagonists where they don't accomplish their goals. Um so it's it's kind of similar in that respect. Uh but and I also think that reflects a lot of the mood of the time, really. You know, like yeah. I think everybody was lied to about Vietnam. Everybody saw what was happening with the race riots, you know, it was it was it was yeah. turmoil in the 70s. Yeah. It's it's pretty crazy that most of the people in this like they went through the summer of love. Um yeah, but it's like a very common thing. They mentioned the summer of love is the same summer that Watts riots happened. So yeah. like the dichotomy and the sort of lie within that are very clear. It's just very strange oh, yeah. that the 70s was essentially the party era. Like there was a lot of like Studio 51 and things like that. So it's Interesting to see people coming from like a very strong sense of like the 60s and being socially engaged to the 70s. It seemed like it went to a lot of partying. And then in the 80s, it was the me generation, like new Coke, full 100%. It didn't seem like anybody remembered anything from the 60s. At least that's yeah. what it felt like. Yeah. It, Not especially, that when we, especially when we were born <laughs> in the 80s, when we were like, well, wait, what, 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 what? Anyway. Um, but I guess, you know, I guess I could give my final thoughts on the movie, yeah. um, uh, because, you know, uh, considering the, the fractured plot and the intentional ambiguity, um, I quite like this film a lot. Um, it's, it's strange and eerie, but it's very unapologetic. Um, it's not really attempting to make a political point. Um, like I said earlier, I compare it more to like a therapy piece about the political assassination and the political turmoil that was happening at the time. This is more of a, a venting of the spleen, so to speak. Um, so, and I like the, the fact that the movie pretty much treats you like the Parallax Corporation would treat you. It's not going to tell you anything. It's not going to, you know, it, I had to read and pause to read over that fucking flyer that he found in the sheriff's thing so many fucking times. Till I finally saw way at the top Parallax Corporation. I'm like, oh, okay. Now title of the movie. I, I did it. pause that um, a couple times yeah, too. I, yeah. it, it, I, for some reason, really... I saw it immediately because I saw the word free, and my eyes, since I'm you know always paying attention to the freebies, <laughs> I was like, ooh, free, and then I saw Parallax next to it. So okay. they definitely knew how to get into my head at least. So anyway, I, I I appreciate that it's it's of its time of the '70s. It's very long and kind of long telephoto lenses that kind of thing it's it's my jam i love the 70s when it comes to this kind of stuff and i've never seen it before um and considering that um even though i've clearly seen more of warren Beatty than you guys have i'm not a huge fan but i do like him in this movie for what he is even if he is ebert might be right that it might be a little bit one-dimensional of a demand for him but it's it's kind of i think it's kind of okay because the plot is way too confusing to start throwing in you know, pointless exhibition about, oh, I got over my drinking problem or whatever. So I think it's pretty clear. I had an okay time with this. I liked it just fine. I don't know if it's going to be one that I will remember quite as warmly as a lot of the uh, the intel uh, intellectuals and some of the, like, uh, film theorists often stick to it. This one's become popular in the last couple of years. I don't know why exactly. It's fine. Um, it's not particularly about a specific political thing. Um, I know that the paranoia they felt then is the paranoia we feel now. So it feels very current. I was surprised by that. Um, I like the music. I like the cinematography. I was uh, pleasantly surprised by how charming uh, Warren Beatty is because, you know, uh, full disclosure, I was, I lived in Indiana and we were very Republican. Warren Beatty has been very outspoken on being a liberal. 
I have since become very liberal. So it's interesting coming into this guy, seeing him again after knowing of him when I was a child, seeing him as an adult and going, oh, he's actually pretty good rather than like, oh, that's the guy my mom doesn't like. So it was fun to revisit this as an adult and form my own opinion on this guy. I liked it. I would suggest it to people if they have a free afternoon or whatever. I uh, Warren, Warren Beatty, I, I heard that like on the IMDb page that because he was campaigning for George McGovern, since he was so outspoken, he hadn't acted in like five years. Uh, <laughs> this is his first coming back to making a movie, apparently. Well, that makes sense. Uh, I'll say first to start with Warren Beatty is somebody I've seen in precious few films. I think most of the movies he's been in have not aged or like maybe people don't watch them anymore. Um, this has nothing to do with his politics, but like, I know that he was a guest, a huge deal back in the day. And I just feel like there's none of it. Very few of his films that have endured like uh, almost yeah. none. Like shampoo. I, People love shampoo, but I haven't heard about it since then. Um, I, yeah. Bonnie and Clyde would be a big one. Bonnie and Clyde is probably the, the, the biggest more, one. Yeah. Uh, but there, there's Splendor a, in the Grass? I guess I that's irrelevant. Splendor in the Grass? Yeah. I guess it's irrelevant to uh, the Parallax View. Um, Parallax View was a well done thriller. Um, again, like. Obviously, uh, conspiratorial stuff is something that was deeply popular, I think, in this time period in a more mainstream way. Like Oliver Stone, who is a person I think is a piece of shit, um, obviously made his bread and butter on a lot of like uh, conspiratorial stuff. No. Um <laughs> Well, I think after he became famous, he he became known for his conspiratorial nonsense. Before then, he made things like Scarface. Like JFK? Oh, do you yeah. mean the movie JFK? The most right. popular conspiracy movie ever made? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was after... Uh, yeah, before 9-11. That was, well, that was before 9-11, but it was right after he did Natural Born Killers. Like, there was a brief, weird window of time where everyone thought Oliver Stone was going to be hot like uh, Quentin Tarantino. People mm-hmm. thought he was going to be un- unmistakably you know, I, cool. Like even I like saw, Rob Schraub, like a friend of mine. as well. I mean, I yeah. saw I saw a, like I saw a, a program of, yeah. last night that had Kevin Smith's daughter on it, and I was like, oh yeah, Kevin Smith. He was one of those guys. Everybody was like, this is one of the next big directors. That's what they thought for for about five to ten years, and then no. Yeah, he yeah. Was, it was like the, the East Coast Tarantino almost, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. Well, he himself but, uh, is very charming, but yeah. I yeah. can understand I, that I, I don't dislike Kevin Smith. I hate Oliver Stone. That's irrelevant. <laughs> That's fair. If one of you bring up an Oliver Stone movie, we can talk about the fact that I think Oliver Stone is fucking a terrible dude. Um, regardless, I think the Parallax View is an effective thriller. Uh, I think... Um, there's aspects of it that I think people can glom onto today. The Parallax Corporation being a corporation that subtly leads our political ideology. I almost think that's less relevant today than it would be even a few years ago. Yeah, um, at the scale they're talking about, definitely. For it sure. seems like yeah. a thing Bitcoin would pay for now. And we wouldn't be seeing an entire corporation. We would be seeing right. something in the Cayman Islands as right. the name of the company. Yeah. I just wanted to know the internship process. You know, and, you know, I'm taking a summer internship at the Parallax Corporation, Dad. But it's a, it's a well-constructed film. I enjoyed watching it. I think it was a thrill ride. I was surprised how parts of it felt almost... Almost like uh, for the nineteen early nineteen seventies, contemporary James Bondish. Like there was much more action in this film than I expected. There were bar fights and car chases and all you know yeah. tense sequences. And, yeah, yeah, me too. Explosions on boats. This, this movie this had. I totally one hundred percent agree. This movie has the level of action I expected out of the movie Bullet when I watched that, and because it has, they everyone always talks about the car chase, and I was like, oh man, this whole movie's gonna be action, and then you watch it and you realize that a good forty five minutes to two hours is mostly just hanging out in rooms, and then oh my god, such a good car chase. In this one, it was like the whole movie was kind of like the car chase. I had a good yeah. time with it. There was a lot of action. 
not that extreme, but a lot of action. It was good. And the suspense was good. Even that scene where he was on the catwalks in the final scene and trying to escape. And it was, you know, he was plotting out how to get away. Like, it was well done. It was it was yeah. good yeah. tension. It was a good thriller. Yeah. I don't know yeah. what it has to say politically, realistically in the 2020s, but that doesn't matter. It's a well-made movie. Yeah, yeah I, and like I compared it, you know, it treats you like the corporation. It leads you down this crumb path, and then it, that crumb path is just a facade, and you're launched into a black hole, or in this case, a white light, and a guy yeah. with a shotgun. Yeah, it's like um, the Wicker Man. You you see the guy setting himself up for his own trap. So it's yeah. it's definitely him being hoisted by his own petard, yeah. uh, which um, I never get to say in any circumstance outside of this. <laughs> you did it! <laughs> Yay! Um, okay, well, I guess that wraps us up. So it looks like no Hoist. bonus points were awarded this week. Wow, um, we were real stingy Yeah, assholes. we're pretty stingy about it. We want to win this thing. Um, so no bonus points. So as it stands right now, we have 10 points for Chris, 10 points for Russell, and 10 points for Zach to give out in the final round for judgment. Uh, again, as a reminder, this is a political thriller theme, and we are in round one, which was Chris Borov's decision for the Parallax View. Round two, as we've previously decided, is on me. And for my choice for this theme is going to be All the King's Men, 1949 Best Picture winner, uh, directed by Robert Rosen who directed hmm. my favorite film, The Hustler. Um, it was remade in the 2000s with Sean Penn and Jude Law, which wasn't very good. Um, but I've seen this movie, I want to say maybe 15 years ago, and I really liked it. And I feel like it's a good time to talk about the perils of populism. Okay. And that's interesting, because I would have completely confused this one with All the President's Men. Yeah, it's a different I, it's film. It's a it different era. Different different era. This would be the oldest movie we've done in the reboot for the movie Oh, trap. wow. Who's, uh, I guess I will find out. I was going to ask who's in it. Like, who should I look out uh, for? Broderick Crawford and John Ireland are really kind of the only big guys won. I mean, one of them won an Oscar. I think the Willie Stark won an Oscar, I think. Okay. But it definitely won Best Picture. Uh, Din year, though. Anyway. Um... So yeah, that. Uh, so yeah, next time we will be talking about all the King's Men, 1949. We're going to a well, different era of political turmoil. This will be the the first uh, the first time I've seen this movie. I, I I honestly don't have any real conception of it. Uh, I'm not sure what it's about. Yeah, uh, it's based off a play by Robert Penn Warren, and it's based off of Huey Long, the governor of Louisiana. That's it's oh. a kind of a dramatized version of Huey Long. Okay, well, I'm familiar with Huey Long. He was definitely a uh, guy who played a lot of games politically, so it's going to be interesting. Uh, does this get into his relationships, or is this... Oh, uh, yes, you better believe it. Okay, so that should be fun watching then, because he, oh, yeah. he had a Blaze, I believe, was his girlfriend, and she was a well-known stripper at the time. Yeah, oh, it... it, it. Again, it goes well into that. As, okay, as I, I remember. Like I said, it's been I won't spoil years the movie for us. We'll yeah, just right. watch it and have a good time. Go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Alrighty. Well, um, so like we said, hopefully uh, the election turned out okay, and these political thrillers, if not, will hopefully give you some comfort. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully hopefully that was okay <laughs> otherwise yeah. hey guess what we're yeah. in this next four years with you right. because and, that's all right because we'll be in the bunkers as well yeah hopefully everything went okay and I, this didn't just suddenly become super topical guys <laughs> you're listening to this in early november hopefully I haven't been decapitated by a serial killer. I hope that didn't happen, <laughs> but maybe it did. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure. Take care of yourselves and each other. And this has been Chris Boroff signing off. Uh, thanks for listening. This is Russell Carlson. Be sure to uh, like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or YouTube channels. And uh, tell your friends. Thanks a lot. And this is Zach Powers. Be sure to vote. Oh, wait. Actually, it's too late for that. You should have said that in the Halloween episodes. <laughs> you come up with anything? Nothing but fish. How about you? Well, I found out a couple things, but here, I brought you some lunch. You are racist with me. What'd you find out? Oh!